Hey guys, so today I'm thinking of talking to you about stereotypes. So whether or not you have any about people who are visually impaired or you're just not really sure um, if it's okay to have a stereotype or not, or you are interested in hearing how I think about stereotypes as somebody with a visual impairment, go ahead and take a seat and let's talk. Okay, so what do you think of as a stereotype? I know what what I've heard some people say stereotypes for blind people are. I know what I've felt people think of me as a blind person. Um, and I know what I think of when I think of somebody who's blind. And they are all totally different things. Um, and I'm also here to tell you that stereotypes aren't always incorrect, but they're not always the whole truth. So behind every stereotype, there is a truth to it because somewhere somebody must have seen something and must have not been the only person to see it and also you know it must have not just happened with one incident or or one situation so there's always a little bit of truth behind something that people stereotype um just like you know yellow labs what do you think when you think of a yellow labrador they have a lot of energy typically. They're usually pretty good at manipulating their face to make it look super cute. Um, they're very food motivated. So if you come across a yellow lab, that's going to be some of the attributes that you're expecting from them. Now, not all labs are the same and they all have their own very unique personality. So you might actually come across a lab that doesn't have as much energy as the next one or you know, they might just not like treats as much as, as the other lab that you thought of. And that's okay to have assumed those things as long as you don't harm them or, um, you know, cause any harm to labs as a breed by having those stereotypes. Um, so when you think of somebody who is visually impaired or blind the more common term you probably know is blind visually impaired is not usually you know common jargon that people throw around um it is in our community of people with visual impairments and we try to you know describe people who are visually impaired as visually impaired as opposed to blind um because blind is usually and and more correctly defined as you know somebody who can't really see much of anything at all which the common statistic um that i'll tell you is that about maybe 10 percent of people who have some kind of eye condition are actually totally blind or can't see anything but maybe shadows or maybe lights um, but see, in that group, there is already a, uh, a spectrum. So there could be people who whose brains don't detect anything, any information coming from the eyes. Um, and then there's the other people who can still kind of take in light and have their brain kind of, you know, receive that very, very faint image. And so, you know, going from there, we can think about somebody who is just impaired visually, meaning there's some kind of um, dysfunction or some kind of, uh, what's the other word that I'm looking for? Like a, a, a degeneration of certain parts of the eye in, in tissue or photoreceptors, or maybe there's some clouding or maybe there's um, something that's not formed correctly 
or maybe there's something that is torn or severed. There's so many different ways um, that the eye can be affected to then produce an impairment in vision. And so that's always something very important to think about. And that's always something that people like me or even people who don't have a visual impairment but are familiar with the, the concept try to inform people about because it's very important to understand when you're encountering somebody who is visually impaired or blind that you don't actually really know what they can and cannot see. It's not always just nothing at all. So that's the first thing, I, you know, they are visually impaired, so there are going to be things that are gonna be hard for them to see. That is something that you can assume. If you know that they are visually impaired or blind, you can assume that there is something that is harder for them to see than for you who might not have a visual impairment. Another thing you can assume is that they will appreciate more description for things. So depending on the vision, again, they could probably see pretty well and might not really need too much help in the realm of description, but it is always useful because you don't know how much they can and cannot see to be very well, um, you know, to have a good way with words, unlike my sentence right there, you know, you want to have a very um, verbally descriptive way of telling somebody about something, not just using gestures or pointing and saying over there or that thing. Um, you want to try to talk to them in a way that can give them the information that their eyes might not be giving them. And so just in general, and it's a good habit too, to just learn how to use words more efficiently, more fluently, more effectively. And so you want to describe things by their shape and size, color, texture, whatever is relevant to the information that you're trying to relay. Don't be going and, and describing every fine little detail about it unless it's something that they might want to know. Like if you're in an art gallery and you want to describe all the details about the paintings or the sculptures, that's when you can probably use a lot of fine detail words. But if you're just trying to tell somebody how to get to the bathroom, you don't have to tell them everything that they're going to be passing in fine detail. You just probably want to tell them how many tables they're going to pass or what part of the wall the door to the bathroom is on. Um, you know, bigger landmark kind of things that they're going to be able to detect either with their hands or their ears, any usable vision that they have, if any. And, um, you know, if they're using a cane, what their cane might be able to pick up, changes in texture on the floor, things like that. Not, probably not things like, um, you know, artwork that might be on the wall as they're passing it because depending on lighting and contrast of the artwork, they might not even be able to tell that there is artwork there. So. Like I said, bigger landmark things like furniture and texture are pretty good to use. Um, here's another thing. As I was growing up, I always felt that people ostracized me more because they just didn't know what I was able to understand. And to them, they weren't sure why, like, you know, they weren't able to grasp the concept of not having vision and how that affected everything about you. To some people, having a visual impairment equals having a cognitive impairment. And so they kind of group you in the same um, class and, and, you know, cognitive ability as somebody with a developmental delay, um, an inability to, you know, understand what's going on socially and interact appropriately, which with a visual impairment, especially one that's congenital, meaning one that you grow up with, 
that can happen. There are some social things that people only learn if they can see them and pick them up, like the small like nuances of facial expressions or um, you know, how people react to things that are said or done are very maybe like low key or very, you know, small, minute things that you're not gonna be able to pick up if you have a visual impairment sometimes. And so what you do as a person with visual impairment is you pick it up by hearing how people react or by knowing how people tell a story about somebody reacting to something and you kind of gather all that information. It's kind of like learning manually. That's why a lot of times um, younger kids, especially with more severe visual impairments, are diagnosed with things like autism and ADHD because they have that trouble with social cues and social interactions. So it could be just the idea that, you know, rocking back and forth in your seat while you're waiting for something to happen looks a little strange and, you know, isn't really something that other people do. But the person with a visual impairment, you know, might not notice that other people don't rock in their seats or that people are noticing that they are rocking in their seat. And so, like I was saying, when I was growing up, I didn't do a lot of that kind of stuff, um, you know, rocking and things like that, because I could see enough to know that other kids weren't rocking. And I could also kind of pick up, you know, when teachers would call other kids out for doing things like leaning back in their chair um, or making noise with their pencils and things like that. You know, you can pick up that kind of stuff when, when somebody's paying attention and calls it out. And so, you know, I, I didn't do a lot of those kinds of things, but still there were things that I was, you know, I was just very shy to interact because I didn't know how people were going to react to how I spoke to them or what I said to them. A lot of my time was spent observing and listening to people, how they talked to then kind of figure out my own way of how I could start conversations with people like, oh, this person started a conversation with somebody this way and that seems to make the other person smile and want to talk to them. So that's what I would try to kind of copy or, or learn my own way of doing. But still, because I had to look at things closer or if somebody passed by me and waved and smiled and I didn't interact with them. Um, they might just be like, oh, I guess she just doesn't want to be my friend. But I never knew because I never saw them, you know, walk by me, smile and wave. And so things were kind of tough that way. But luckily, you know, when you're smaller, elementary school, everybody kind of just wants to be friends with everybody. And so they want to ask everyone if they want to play with them outside. And so I did find my small little group of, of girls sometimes, you know, at recess who wanted to play pretend or or do things like that and we would just hang around and and play in the grass and that kind of stuff um you know i wouldn't really do a lot of tag sometimes but I, it was not my favorite you know jump rope was a little bit hard but i liked to stand and watch and cheer people on with with other people if i knew that that was what they were doing um but you know going into middle school and kids kind of not wanting to hang around other kids that would kind of move them down a level on the social scale, you know, that would kind of happen. So, you know, nobody would really want to be seen hanging out with the girl with the disability, right? Because then they would probably be grouped into that kind of section of people and the cool people who thought they were cool and who, you know, didn't have any kind of disabilities or flaws as they would present themselves, you know, wouldn't want to hang out with those other people. And so it just kind of like that stereotype is something that I witnessed as a kid that, you know, having a disability was a weird, awkward thing that didn't really let you fit in socially with other people. Until I went to college and I met some really, really great, nice people who didn't have that kind of concept in their head about ostracizing people just because they were different. I still kind of had that feeling inside me that I needed to contribute something 
to the group so that they would let me stay in, you know? Like if I wasn't funny or if I wasn't interesting, there wasn't really anything about me that would allow me to, you know, befriend material. And so I really tried hard to find my personality and find things about myself that I thought other people would be interested in. Um, which isn't the best thing to do. You should just be yourself. And if you are naturally funny or if you have jokes and things like that, you know, bring them up naturally, not try to like always be the funny one or always have the sassy blind girl jokes all the time. Um, I don't feel like I did that too much, but I did have that interior, like, you know, feeling in my heart, like, oh, I haven't said anything in a while. Nobody's laughed at anything I said in a while. They must not be really, you know, feeling like I'm being interesting right now. So I should try to say something, you know, that was a very hard thing to like, get over. Um, there's also a lot of like the stereotypes that you see on TV and movies, um, you know, blind people don't have a job or if they do have a job, they've had to like work super, super hard um, or maybe they already had a job and then they became blind and already knew how to do their job and just like continued doing their job um, or maybe, you know, the, the blind person likes to take advantage of people or maybe a blind person is like super super talented in one thing and that's what they're known for um that's kind of tough because we are just like normal people you know some people have really have talents that they've honed and you know advanced over time and have gotten really good at that talent and you know worked on it so now it's a very fine skill that they have other people are just average people who you know have small talents here and there and some skills that they've picked up here and there but you know they might just be normal like in the sense that there's nothing really superb or extraordinary about them you know, they're just like everybody else in that way where, you know, they have things that they're good at and things that they're not good at. And they might just be good at the things that they're good at, not excellent or superior or anything like that. Um, and then there are the people who are like that, who have talents and, and they really wanted to work on them. And then now they are experts and professionals in, in that area. And so that's pretty cool. But that's just like a normal person, you know? Skills are skills and you work on them to make them better. That has nothing to do with whether you can see or not. Um, so that's tough sometimes. You know, the other stereotypes like you must be really, really good at, you know, hearing things or feeling things and being very um, good at picking up details and stuff like that, which you know, out of necessity, the less that I am able to use my eyes, the more that I have to use my sense of touch and hearing to give me information about the world around me, um, you know, then that's another skill that you can, you know, accelerate and, and get better and that kind of stuff. So, you know, there are some blind people who still are probably not that great at picking up sounds or hearing people, you know, and telling who they are by their footsteps or how they breathe or whatever, you know, they haven't practiced that skill enough to, to get it to that expert level. And, you know, same thing with, with touch. There are some people who have had to learn braille and get their fingers very sensitive to, you know, decoding the braille code and and picking up all those dots and reading braille super fast and then there's people like me who know braille but i didn't practice it every day and i don't read it every day and so i'm still kind of really slow at reading braille i don't know which one i'm slower at you know whether i can read print faster or braille faster but both are very slow for me and so things like reading, I don't know, like when I was doing 
um, drama club or when I was doing musical theater, reading things like scripts and music scores and stuff like that were not my best skill when I was doing like a dry read or sight reading music. I have to listen to it a lot and practice it and say it and sing it a lot before I can memorize it. Um, granted, because of that, that is one of the skills that I have that are, you know, a little bit higher than average, not the best, but I can, I can pick up music and memorize it pretty quickly with, you know, and be off book in a day or two, whereas like some other people kind of, their brains rely on needing to look at it and read it several times before they can memorize it. And so, you know, that kind of thing, like I'm just a person who has had to work on some skills more than other people and, you know, my skills are at a different level than some other people might be and then some other people might have their skills at an even higher level than me and it just is about taking the time and working on it. Um, let's see, another stereotype is that if you have a cane or a guide dog or wear dark sunglasses that means that you're blind but if you don't have those things then it's harder for people to understand the concept that you're visually impaired. And that's probably also just from movies and TV and stuff like that because when you're making a movie, you only have a certain number of minutes to tell a whole story and give people background about characters and what's going on. So you need to use things like that to give people information as quickly as possible. So, you know, at some point somebody has to be shown as doing something that reminds the, you know, the audience who's not as learned on visual impairment, you know, to, to give that audience the idea that that person can't see well. And so, although not everybody who is visually impaired or blind prefers to use a cane or a guide dog or wear dark sunglasses, those are the things that are very iconic and that's why they're used a lot in movies and TV. What's good is if like a show represents people who are visually impaired and you know a TV show has a lot more time to introduce characters and and give you the story and, and what's going on and so in those situations you know you can get to see how somebody who's visually impaired might not always need to use their cane. Like at home, you know, they can walk around just like anybody else because they're used to the layout of the furniture. Um, most of the time, the furniture is not being moved on them without letting them know. And, you know, they know where things are without having to use special apps or braille or anything like that. You know, there's other ways that we can tell what things are, especially in our own home, depending on, you know, our organizational skills. Um, usually they're pretty good, but like I said, again, you know, there are some blind people and visually impaired people who aren't very good at organizing stuff, regardless of the necessity that it could be for them. And so there's just so many things. Um, one thing that I, that I do like about stereotypes in a way is that somebody when they do see me with my cane or my guide dog they feel more inclined to approach me first and talk to me and introduce themselves to me and ask me if I need any help with anything because they know those things as signs and symbols that I have some kind of um, impairment in my vision. Uh, the thing I don't like about stereotypes, like I said before too, is that it could mean that people feel strange and uncomfortable and a little scared to approach. You know, I feel like a lot of the reason that I didn't start dating until my mid-twenties was because people just didn't know how it would be to date me and, you know, that's a whole nother topic, you know, whether I, I feel like guys nowadays are 
are brave the way they should be and you know other total whole different story but you know having a visual impairment kind of affected that I feel like you know whether or not people told me but I know from living it you know that there are just things that people feel uncomfortable with or like they're just not sure about and they don't know how to approach it or how to talk about it they don't want to offend you um sometimes or they just don't want to deal with it there's like those two sides of it like there are the really nice people who are like scared to approach you because they don't want to say the wrong thing and they don't want to do the wrong thing and then there's the people who are just like weirded out and just don't even want to bother with it and don't care and so you know that's something that stereotypes have done and it takes knowledge it takes research it takes education um it takes people like me people like other um influencers youtubers advocates um you know motivational speakers all those kinds of people to go out there and talk about their experiences as an individual with visual impairment or blindness and share other people's stories too so that everybody can see how different we are you know you might find my videos entertaining and someone else's videos not entertaining and we can both have a visual impairment or even probably more truthfully you would find some other people's videos more entertaining than mine or more interesting and mine not so much and that's not because of our visual impairment but more because of our personality how we talk what we talk about and all of that kind of stuff. So what I kind of want to say is take the good things from stereotypes, but not the bad. Unless you have, you know, proof of how someone's personality and yours might not mix from you trying to interact with them you know, don't automatically assume that you wouldn't be able to talk to somebody because of a stereotype. And I mean that in general, for all stereotypes of all sorts of things. Um, but here, mostly visual impairment and blindness. So if you, you know, go out and you see somebody who's visually impaired, don't automatically think that you're not gonna know how to interact with them. Just go ahead and give it a try. Just say hello see how they are see you know if you click have a conversation don't even bring up the visual impairment you know there's more to me there's more to them than just what our eyes can't do so have fun <laughs>